Hello and welcome back to another reinforcement learning tutorial. We've been moving step by step from the very basic concepts such as the Bellman equation and moving forward toward the most advanced cutting edge techniques in the field of reinforcement learning. Let's take one moment to review what we've covered recently. Deep Q learning attempts to estimate Q values of each state and action pair using a neural network. We back propagate the network using the mean squared difference between the predicted Q values and the actual estimated Q values. Policy is chosen by taking the action with the highest Q value, but this becomes impractical in environments with larger continuous action spaces and breaks down as environments get more complex. Policy gradient methods return a matrix of probabilities for each action via a softmax function. Exploration is handled automatically via the return probabilities. We don't care about calculating accurate values for each state in action. Instead, we adjust the action probabilities based on whether the policy performed better or worse than expected. Which brings us to an important concept of the policy's baseline. The reinforced method scales the policy gradient by total rewards. This is extremely limited. Last tutorial, we subtracted a moving average of recent rewards from the actual reward as a baseline. The most accurate method, however, is to use the actual value of each state as a baseline. Some states are better than others. Obviously, a player with high health and superior weapon is going to get much higher rewards than a player who is out of health and ammo. All we expect of our AI is to do the best it can given the circumstances. With a less intelligent baseline like the moving average we were using before, our agent can take a really good action in a bad situation and still get punished for having a low reward. Advantage rewards anything better than expected for the state. To calculate the advantage, we simply take the Q value for each state in action, that is the calculated return for the action taken, minus the estimated value of the state which comes from our network. If the returns on an action are better than the expected value of the state, we increase the probability of taking that action. And if the returns are worse than expected, we decrease the probability. Now, the next step toward getting cutting edge reinforcement learning results is the actor critic architecture. We're going to use a neural network with two outputs, a policy head and a value head. The policy head outputs probabilities for taking each action. The value head outputs a single number, the value of the current state. The predicted value is then subtracted from the actual returns of the action to obtain the advantage and scale the policy gradient. All right, let's take a look at the basic advantage actor critic algorithm, also abbreviated as A2C. First, we initialize the network parameters theta with random weights. Two, play n steps in the environment using the current policy, saving state action reward transitions. 3. Set R to 0 if we reach the end of the episode. Otherwise, set R to the value of the state. 4. I equals T minus 1 all the way to T start. Now we're looping backwards from the end of the episode. R equals the reward from this time step plus gamma times R. The policy loss is the negative log probability times the advantage. Value loss is simply the mean squared error of the actual return calculated minus the value of the state that our network estimated. Step five, we apply stochastic gradient descent using a mean policy and value loss over each batch. And six, we repeat from step two over and over again until the learning has converged. All right, now let's take a look at the asynchronous advantage actor critic, abbreviated A3C. Policy gradients is an online method, which means we must train on data obtained from the current policy. Yet to keep our training data independent and identically distributed IID, we still need a large buffer of transitions to train on. The solution is to run multiple environments in parallel to obtain large amounts of training data from a single policy. This is much faster with multiprocessing, which we can do in Python. MP.Q is a thread safe FIFO first in first out queue for transporting training data to the network. MP.process runs a piece of code in a child process with methods to control it from the main process. PyTorch includes its own multiprocessing wrapper, torch.multiprocessing, which properly handles tensors and shared memory across both the CPU and GPU. 
and the API is exactly the same as Python's multiprocessing API. The goal of this series is to build step by step from the basic concepts towards the most advanced reinforcement learning algorithms. My goal is to keep the code clean so that you understand it and not necessarily to provide the absolute best implementation of actor critic possible. In the following videos, we are going to learn how to tweak this actor critic architecture to get the absolute best results on a variety of tasks. We're going to be adding even more complexity later, so be sure you understand well what is happening here before moving on. All right, let's jump into the code. We'll start with the architecture of the neural network in the Atari A2C class. First, we have the same convolutional layers as before. The output from the observation head is then split and passed into the separate policy and value heads. These each contain a hidden layer of 512 neurons plus an output. The policy network outputs logits representing the probability of each possible action. The value network outputs one value, the estimated value of the state that was input into the network. Next, let's look at the unpack batch function. This returns separate torch tensors of states, actions, and calculated Q values of the state action pairs. First, we unpack the states, actions, and rewards into separate lists. Then for each transition where the episode is not over, we need to calculate the value of state prime. So we save the index and state prime of each non-terminal transition. We pass a state prime list through the network to estimate the values. If the state was terminal, the Q value is simply the reward received. Otherwise, the Q value is the reward plus gamma times the value of the state prime. Note that since each transition contains multiple unrolled steps, we are actually using gamma to the power of num steps. Finally, we convert everything back to torch tensors and return the states, actions, and Q values. The reward tracker class keeps statistics on each episode and tells us when training is finished as well as when to save the checkpoint when we have reached the new highest ever reward. This is the same as we used before. Now, let's move on to the main a3c.py file. At the top, as usual, we have the hyperparameters. Most of these are the same as in previous tutorials. You'll recall one of the biggest problems in policy gradients is over-adjusting the policy and screwing it up. Clip grad limits the size of the update across each layer of our network at each step. This makes training more stable. Total environments is the number of environments that we're going to be running in parallel. Process count is the number of cores that your CPU has and is looked up automatically through the multiprocessing library. Environments per process is the number of environments that will be run inside each child process. Moving down, data func is a function that is run inside each process. It takes a reference to the neural network, the device, either CPU or GPU, and a reference to the training queue. It generates a specified number of environments that the agent will be playing and reporting data on. Then it simply plays episode after episode, appending each transition to the queue until the process is stopped. Every time an episode is complete, we output the total rewards from that episode. Now onto the main program. We initialize the neural network in the training queue. We spawn an instance of data func for each processor in our computer. We enter a try block. This means that if we encounter any error, the training will be aborted, but the cleanup section under the finally block will still run. We're going to track the total reward of each episode. We're also going to track a moving average of the statistics over 100 episodes. Now we enter the training loop. We pluck one training entry from the queue. If it is an instance of the total reward class, we track the total reward and conditionally save a checkpoint. We append training entries to the list until we have a complete batch. Then we unpack the batch to get a list of states, actions, and Q values. We clear the batch to empty the list. We zero out the gradients in the network. We input the batch of states into the network and get back batches of logits and values. The value loss is calculated by a simple mean squared error. The logits go through a softmax and are converted into log probabilities in one shot. 
the advantage is the reference queue values we calculated minus the estimated values from the value network. The policy gradients, negative log probabilities, are scaled by the advantage. Policy loss is the mean gradient over the batch. As before, we're going to add an entropy bonus to the loss function. Actually, we were supposed to take the negative entropy bonus and subtract it from the loss, but the two minus signs cancel each other out. When the entropy is high, and thus the network is uncertain about which action to take, this will reduce the loss. The final loss function is the addition of the entropy loss, value loss, and policy loss. It's common in actor critic to give the policy loss more importance, such as two times by reducing the value loss, but we're not doing that here. We back propagate the loss, clip the gradients to prevent large changes, and then run one step of the optimizer. For the last part, we're simply tracking a bunch of useful statistics in TensorBoard. We went over most of them in the policy gradients tutorial. When training is done, the finally block performs cleanup. We send a signal to terminate each process and then wait for it to exit. That's all there is to it. I encourage you to try this out and play around with different environments. If you want to train with your GPU, you'll probably need to downgrade to PyTorch 0.4.0 as 0.4.1 had issues at the time I made this. As usual, I appreciate your comments and let me know what results you can come up with. This is Colin Scow, and I look forward to seeing you next time, where we'll take another step toward learning how to produce cutting-edge reinforcement learning results. Until then, happy coding.